Again, God's peacemakers, we ought to know what's right. We ought to know what is good, what is evil. We ought to know what's right. We ought to know what is wrong. Now, some will tell you that what's right, what's good, what's evil, all of it is subjective, is what some will say to you. What's good to me, it may not be good to you. Some will say, hey, what you think is right, I may not think is right. I may think that it is wrong. And as I have said in recent weeks, there's a whole lot of confusion in our world today. And therein, my key verses, we'll see that some, they confuse good for being evil and evil for being good. There are many people in the world today who don't know right from wrong. This often happens because there are many who want to have absolute authority over the truth. There are many that want to have absolute authority over what is good and what is evil, over what is right and what is wrong. But the truth of the matter is that there is only one who has absolute authority over what is right and wrong and what is good and evil. That one that has absolute authority over what is right and wrong, what is good and evil, is the Lord. Now, something that we should understand today is that when God speaks about what's right, he's speaking about what leads to salvation. Everlasting life in his kingdom. When God speaks about what's wrong, he speaks about what offends him. He speaks about what is an offense to him. He speaks about what is evil in his sight. He speaks about what it is that will lead to everlasting condemnation. So something that I want you to understand today is that the petty squabbles that we have in our world and in our society today, the petty squabbles over our opinions, our subjective truths, what we think is right, what we think is wrong, those petty squabbles, they aren't of much of a concern to the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying there today? The only time our petty squabbles, they become a concern to God is if they hurt or harm the soul. Otherwise, God, he's not concerned about the petty squabbles that, that we have in the world today. That's being stirred up by man. Again, God is not the author of confusion. That's us. We are the masters of creating hysteria. We are the masters of creating confusion. You see, this is where we, the peacemakers, this is where we come into the picture. As Paul wrote, we have been made stewards of the mysteries of God. What this means for us is that we sincere believers, we have been made supervisors of what is good and evil. We have been made supervisors over what is right and wrong. We have been made supervisors over what is holy, what is righteous. We have been made supervisors over what is the truth. Now, someone will hear that and they will say, they will ask the question, what makes you, what gives you the authority over the truth? What makes you know what is right and wrong? Well, we have been made supervisors over what is holy and righteous. We have been made supervisors over what's right and wrong. We have been made that supervisor by Christ himself. Christ, he commissioned us, right? He gave us the task to go out in the world sharing the gospel, sharing the good news, 
sharing again what is holy and righteous. That again, that task, it has been given to all believers who have received the gospel. It has been given to us by Christ. So if anybody's ever confused about that, that is why we say that we have authority over what is right and what's wrong. And again, that authority over what's right and wrong is talking about what brings salvation and what will lead to condemnation. And so as stewards over the gospel, Paul, he said that we should be faithful to the gospel. You should be faithful to the gospel. You should be faithful to the truth. You should be faithful to what's right. The question that you must answer today, are you faithful to the good news? Are you faithful to the gospel? Are you faithful to the truth? Are you faithful to what's right? Through our scripture, God's children, we are charged to be faithful, aren't we? Through our scripture, we are charged to do good, aren't we? Am I making that up? So that leaves some of us wondering, well, what is the good that we are supposed to do? How many of us have ever wondered that? What's the good that I'm supposed to do? Now, many of us, we often sum up, if somebody does to ask us that question, what's the good thing that we're supposed to do? Many of us would say, I'm supposed to help somebody. That's what we say, isn't it? You ask, you ask any Christian, they'll say, I'm supposed to help. We just sum it up. And y'all know how I am about summed up answers. I don't care much for summed up answers, even though that's the right answer. Scripture, it gives us a much broader answer to, again, what our calling is, what it is that, that we are supposed to do. Yes, we are supposed to help. But again, Scripture, it gives us a much broader answer than I'm supposed to help. In the sixth chapter of Micah and the eighth verse, for anyone that turns over to that, that scripture, I know that that book may be hard for some of us to find. We find in the sixth chapter of Micah and the eighth verse that in the broader answer, scripture tells us or asks us there, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In the 11th Psalm and the seventh verse, David, he said, the Lord is righteous. He, God loves righteousness. God, David said, God loves what's right and what's good. Of course he does, doesn't he? Over in the 61st chapter of Isaiah and the eighth verse, God, he speaks for himself. We're in the 61st chapter of Isaiah and the eighth verse. You'll see that the Lord said, for I, the Lord, love justice. God, he's telling us what it is that he loves. God, he is telling us what's right. He's telling us what's good. And what's right, what's good in his eyes is justice. So if justice is what's right in the eyes of God, if justice is what's good in the eyes of God, what does that mean for us? What, what should we love? What should we consider to be right in our eyes? If justice is right in the eyes of God, if justice is what God loved, then guess what? We should love justice. And, and we should find that justice is right in our eyes. Now, some of us hearing that, oh, we're going to smile at that one. Some of us are going to say, I'm a blue blood. I love me some justice. I love, I love getting, I love getting some justice. And that's what some of us say. I don't have to look far. I can, I can go on YouTube and I can see it. I can turn on the news. There, 
There are many justice warriors in the world today, isn't it? Now, now something that we need to understand today is that God's justice, it differs drastically from our thoughts on justice. Y'all hear me here today? Pastor about to go somewhere with this one. You see, if you look in the dictionary, we define justice as the maintenance and the administration of what is just. The dictionary, it then add that, that justice is determined by impartial adjustment of conflicting claims. Listen to that one more time. The dictionary will tell us that justice is the maintenance and the administration of what is just that justice is determined by quote unquote impartial judgment. I love those words. Impartial adjustment of conflicting claims. It'd be wonderful if justice actually worked that way, wouldn't it? Now, if you want to know something about God's justice, turn with me over to the 34th chapter of the book of Exodus. Over in the 34th chapter of the book of Exodus and the sixth verse there, we will see God, he proclaims his justice. God, he speaks more about what it is that he loves. Most importantly, God, he speaks about how it is that he moves. There in the 34th chapter of the book of Exodus and the sixth verse, the Lord he proclaims there that he keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But this is the most important part here where the Lord, he says there, by no means does he clear the guilty. Again, the scripture says there, the Lord, he proclaims there that he keeps mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, but by no means clears the guilty. Now this is just a part of God's justice. And this part of God's justice, it speaks to something that, that many of us, that, that we'll think of when it comes to justice. This speaks to retribution. It speaks to the, the convicted wrongdoer, the sinner receiving their just punishment. And again, when, when many of us, when we think about justice, this is what we think about. We think about retribution. You know, the governments, governments around the world, they've established their laws, right? Laws about what's right and what's wrong. And, and when one breaks that law, the government loves to step in, right? Policemen, they step in and they arrest you. And what is it that they say? We gonna bring you to justice, right? And so, you know, when we think about justice, we think about criminals, the criminals being punished. And we think about what we are going to do for those who are wronged. We'll say, we're gonna get justice. We are going to get it for you. Yeah, something that we, I know, I know this for certain, something that we have seen in our justice system is its flaws. Now I know some ain't gonna like to hear that one because our justice system is perfect, ain't it? Oh, I got a no there. I got a chuckle there. You see, for a long time it has been recognized that there is an unjust bias in our justice system. When it comes to the punishment of, of wrongdoers, we see an unjust, right, system, a bias in our system, favoritism, if you will, in our system, partiality, if you will, in our system. See, in our system, what is fair, it often leans one way for, for some, and then it leans a totally different direction for others, doesn't it? Now, it's such a biased system it's such a biased way of justice. Is that right? 
would God, would God stand in support of such a biased system? Well, what is it that's right? In the first chapter of Deuteronomy and the 17th verse, we are told that God, he doesn't support a biased system. The children of Israel, they were commanded in that scripture in Deuteronomy, the first chapter, the 17th verse, not to show partiality in judgment. To be fair in judgment, Moses, he said to the children of Israel, he said, you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence. I think a lot of people need to hear that one today. You shall hear the small, Moses said. Don't you ignore the small, Moses said there. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence. For the judgment is God's. God, we must remember that he is impartial. He doesn't care who you are. As Paul wrote in the second chapter of Romans, in the 11th and the 12th verse, if you want to turn and look at it for yourself, you'll see that the scripture says, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Again, keep in mind what Jesus said about you judging somebody. Jesus, he warned. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. We have to be careful with First off, how we think of people and how we treat people. We must, again, if we desire to do what's right, again, we must treat everyone the same. We must be fair with all people. Uh, kind of quiet in here today, huh? what's right and what's wrong. God has shown us in our judgment, we are wrong to think little of small people. Uh-oh. We are wrong to show favoritism to those who have wealth and to those that like to go around and say that they're rich. We are wrong when we treat them differently from one who may be less fortunate. We are wrong when we treat those who are less fortunate than we are when we look down on them. And that's one of the biggest problems that we have today within the church, within those that say that they, that they are a child of God, within those that say that they are Christians, looking down on others in our judgment, in our bias. Jesus said that you better remove that speck from your eyes if you're going to go around judging people that way because that judgment will be coming on to you as well if that's how you want to move. We have to be careful with how we move in this world, how we go about judging folks in this world today. Do us right. Now, while retributive justice, punishment that is, Wow, that is justice to many, 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 many people in the world today. God's justice, I want you to understand today, doing what's right, it extends beyond, we gonna get you justice. We gonna fight for, for your justice today by getting this criminal. It extends beyond, it extends beyond that. Now, this is the point in my sermon here today where I want to remind you about the Lord that he is love. God is love. And again, if you're still with me there in the 34th chapter of the book of Exodus, if you take a look at the sixth verse there, we will see the part of God's justice that's actually mentioned first with how God moves. 
God, he proclaimed that in that verse that he's merciful. We see that there. God, he proclaimed that he's merciful, that he's gracious. And then on top of that, the Lord said that he abounds in goodness and truth. He abounds, I repeat, abounds in goodness and truth. What this means is God's goodness is plentiful. God has so much goodness that he's able to spread it around. He's able to share it, not with some people. He's able to share it with all people and he doesn't run out. He abounds in goodness and truth. The Lord said there. Let us understand today that this statement from the Lord, it speaks to God's dispersing of just of justice. That is distributive justice, if you will. You see, scripture shows us time and time again that when one asks in faith, God, he doesn't hold back, does he? When one asks in faith, does God, does God hesitate? When one asks in faith, is God reluctant to give? Oh, room kind of silent on that one. You see, I, I think of, of Solomon in this moment. When Solomon, he asked of God to give him the wisdom to be able to discern justice. And I think about how the Lord he didn't hesitate. God gave to Solomon exactly what it was that he asked for. God tells us today that he will give us the desires of our heart when it comes to glorifying him. God, I want you to understand today that he's a liberal giver. And I want to be clear about that because a lot of people, they, they mind switch instantly as soon as they hear liberal. They get into politics. I ain't talking about politics right now. I'm talking about God. God is a liberal giver because he has much to give and he's not reluctant in his giving. James, he wrote in the first chapter of James and the fifth verse, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. Now, while retribution, while re retributive justice is important to God, I tell you today that God, he would still much rather give. God, he would much rather bless than to have to punish anyone. God does not want to punish anyone. God, he does not want to condemn. Why do you think he gave the world his only begotten son? Because that was what was right. Let us remember what it said in the 29th chapter of Jeremiah in the 11th verse, that scripture that I always reference, where the Lord said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace, not evil. God doesn't have any evil thoughts towards us. That would be wrong. God, he's holy and righteous. God's thoughts to us are of the future, of peace, hope. Again, God always desires. He's always thinking about, always moving to bless you. See, he gave as the greatest blessing of all. And to all people, his only begotten son. He gave it to all, not to some, not to a select few. He wasn't showing any favoritism in giving his only begotten son. He wasn't showing a bias in the giving of his only begotten son. He gave the world is what Jesus said in the third chapter of Judge's gospel in the 16th verse. Think about it. When God created mankind, the Lord created us to be fruitful and to multiply. 
That's his thoughts. That's his desire is for us to be fruitful and to multiply, to be blessed. Now, someone somewhere right now is thinking to themselves, man, pastor, why are you up there lying? Someone somewhere right now is thinking, well, if God, if he's such a fair giver, if he's such a liberal giver, why don't I have anything? That's what somebody's thinking right now. Someone somewhere right now is looking at their neighbor and they're saying, well, well, Joe got that over there. Why don't I have what, what Joe got? Is what somebody's thinking right now. The, the word of God, once again today, it forces us to think. It forces us to consider. It, focuses, it forces us, I should say, to answer whether or not we are living according to God's desire. If God is a liberal giver, one has to wonder, what are we doing? We always talk about what we don't have. We always talk about what others have. We always talk about there being homeless people in the world, about there being hunger in the world, don't we? But, but as I rolled through, through Georgia last week on my way back, on our way back from Reynolds and to Reynolds, I was looking at all of the land, the crops that was out there. And, and I was thinking to myself, why is there hunger in the world? See, a lot of us, we like to try to blame God, but I blame us. What are we doing? What are we doing today? Are we doing what's right by each other? You know, we, we, we always like to use the Lord as a scapegoat for, for the problems that we have stirred up in the world. But we won't look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are we doing what's right for each other? If God is a liberal giver, we should be liberal in, in our giving. If good to God is to lift us up, then guess what? What's right for us is to lift each other up. I say it all the time. I don't know if y'all done got tired of me preaching that, lifting each other up, but I have to preach it. Because I look around in the world that we're living in today and I see too much of, of oppression. Too much tearing down, too much holding each other down. We, we lack prospering in this world because it seems like we don't want each other to prosper. Those who have supposedly prospered, they do their best to, to continue to step down on the little man. We should be helping each other to flourish in this world today. But I just shake my head at it because I look at the world today and it seems only a select few is flourishing. What is that number? They say 1%. That's terrible. Is that what God, is that what God created us to, to be like? To where only 1% is flourishing? I don't think so. That's not my God. Yeah, God, he created us to be fruitful and to multiply. Always keep that, always keep that in mind. Keep that in heart today. When we talk about being a peacemaker. Now, when we take a look at the scripture there in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, the scripture there from the eighth through the 25th verse there, We'll again, we'll see just how incomplete our idea of justice is. We have seen retribution from the Lord. We have seen his dispersing that God is liberal in, in his giving. Now, we, 
we like to think that we have the, the retribution part. We like to think that we have that one down pat, but we've already seen how flawed that one is. We know that there's favoritism in our quote unquote justice system. And I promise you, I'm not preaching a, a political sermon, but again, just looking at the world that we live in today. But what about our dispersing? What about our giving? Are we just in, in our giving, in our doing today? There in the eighth verse, we'll see the scripture, it says there, woe to those who join house to house and add field to field. Woe, the scripture said there. This is what the children of Israel were doing. This is what was happening in Israel in its day of wickedness. Now, some of us, we may look at that and we may not understand what's being said there, but they were building big houses, big homes, and they was adding field to field there. They had these large fields that they were, uh, that they had possessed there. Those who were doing this in Israel, we should understand were the greedy. They were greedy. They built up their homes. They had lots of land, but what about those who were in need? The scripture tells us that those who were in need, the, the greedy had built up so much that those who were poor, those who are in need, they had no place to stay. Only the greedy was able to stay in the land as the, the less fortunate, the poor. Those in need, they were being pushed out. Does that sound like it was right? Guess what's happening in the world today? We're talking about dispersing justice, doing what's right by each other. Are we doing what's right by each other today? See, again, like I said last week, all it takes is some simple observation, discerning with the spirit. Not just with the eyes, but within the spirit. The rich continue to get rich in our world today. Those who are in need, they continue to be in need. The little man, as they like to say, continue to go out and, and work in warehouses. We have so many warehouses around us in Union City. So many of us, we, we go out, we work hard for, for that dollar. We get little in return. Still struggle with bills, still struggle with putting food on the table. In the good old year of 2024. The rich say that they care about others, but, but CEOs, they, they continue to collect bonuses while the ground floor worker is still struggling. They get bonuses while the little man struggle to even get a raise. Oh boy. Oh boy. I know somebody not going to like to hear that, but that's okay. I'm used to not being liked. I'm good with it. Everywhere you turn today, the powerful and the greedy, they have their hands stretched out. They don't have their hands stretched out to help lift, lift the little man up. They have their hands stretched out like this. Gimme, give gimme. Give That's what the greedy is all about today when their hands should be stretched out to help lift someone up. Because you see, helping to lift someone up, that's what's right. Not continue to build on and add on to your mansion. Not to continue to add on and to take away from, from the small business. We have so many small businesses that's being hurt by the big corporations, the big CEOs. They look at the small business, they say, I see what you're doing over, small, over that small business. That's fine and good, but now you're starting to hurt my pocket. And I can't have you hurt my pocket. And so greed again takes over. Buy this Bible, because I'm a good man, they, they love to say today. Add on this service, 
that 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 your money should already be paying for. But add on this service because we go kind of keep it secret from you, even though we know that you need this service. Because again, we want to charge extra because of this. Is that what's right? Surely, surely, all of that sounds like justice to me. And I say that sarcastically. I don't agree with it because it's not right. When we continue to look at the fifth chapter of Isaiah there, the 11th and the 12th verse, that those two verses, they'll stick out as well there. Well, the scripture, it says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. Now, when we look at that scripture, we'll start to think about drunkenness. We may think about alcoholics. When we look at that verse there, those two verses there. But I want to point out to you today that those two verses, they talk about a lifestyle that, that many people live today. And I'm not talking about literally getting up and the first thing that you do in the morning is have a beer, have some wine. I'm not talking about that. There are many people today that if you look at that verse, what it says there, they live a lifestyle to where they do not regard the work of the Lord. They are putting the world first is what the scripture is talking about there. God should be first in our life, but there are many in the world today that put the world over God. Their mindset, as y'all have heard me say several times, is for the world and not for the Lord. The scripture says they don't even consider the operation of his hands. You see, we should be grateful for the work of God. We should be grateful for the work that the Lord has done in our life, shouldn't we? God, I want you to understand that he causes his son to rise for all people. His reign that waters the earth for all people. In other words, God, he blesses all people, but not everybody is appreciative of the work of the Lord. How many of us even take the time to realize all that God has done for us? We should, but we don't. If we all recognize how good God is to us, then we will move with love in our hearts. We will move with a high regard for one another. Yes, we would help each other. We would do justly by one another. But again, God, he's disregarded by many in this world. And if they disregard God, you better believe that they will disregard you and they will do wrong by you. You wonder why there's so much mistreatment in our world today? You wonder why so many use us to step up? It's because they disregard us. They disregard the Lord as well. Does that sound right? Nope. So because Israel lived in such a manner, we will see there in the 13th verse that the Lord said, my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Captivity here in this verse is not talking about necessarily the captivity being in the captivity of another man. It's also talking about their being in the bondage of sin. They were living in foolish disobedience. Again, their mindset was for the world and not for the Lord. And the world was holding them hostage. And because they lived in such a manner, we're told that in the 14th verse that Sheol, that is Hades, or better known as hell, has enlarged itself and opened its mouth beyond measure. Sheol, Hades, or hell, we should understand today that it feasts on sin. It feasts on the unrest that's in the world today. It feasts on the darkness that's in the world today. 
If hell was expanding back then, what do you suppose it's doing today? It's opening its mouth up still wider today. I observe a world where good, God's justice is fading away in the world today as darkness continues to, to spread and, and it continues to cover the earth. The scripture even speaks to it there, what was happening in that time in the 20th verse, in my key verse there. Where we'll see it again said there, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Confusing what's good for what's evil. Twisting and, and corrupting what's good for, again, being evil. This, this twisted and corrupted and deranged mindset is growing, growing in our world today. And I, and I say to you that it's frightening with how many of us are confused on what's right and what's wrong. How many of us don't know the difference between good and evil? It's frightening. How many of us are confused on knowing what is holy and righteous from what is sin and wickedness? So that there is no confusion. I say to you today, I don't care how much you hold up a Bible for the world to see. If you live with this twisted mindset today, you're in the wrong. Mm -hmm. I want you to understand today, I don't care if you go to church every Sunday, if you go to Bible study every Wednesday, if you live with such a confused and twisted mindset to where you can't tell the difference between what's holy and righteous from what's sin and wicked, if you can't tell the difference between good and evil, I tell you today that your mindset is in the wrong place. You're in the wrong. Even more, I say to you today that if you support those who live with a twisted and a corrupt mindset to where they confuse good and evil, to where they think that the evil that they're doing is actually right. If you support it, you are joining them in their sin. You are living in the wrong. It's time for you to get in the right. In the third chapter of James, if you want to turn over there and look at it with me there, from the 13th through the 18th verse, James, he wrote about, about the difference between the wisdom of the light and the wisdom that is of the dark. So that, again, there's no confusion over right from wrong, good and evil. James, he stated, if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, he said, don't you boast and lie against the truth, James said. This wisdom, James, he said, does not descend from above, but it's from below. James, he said that it is earthly, sensual, and then, not missing any words there, James said that it is demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, James said, he said, confusion and every evil thing, they are there. Look at our world today. And again, demonic was the word that James used. We live in a demonic world today. And like I said, it's quite frightening. Again, woe to you if your heart is filled with this corruption or if you support those who have such a corrupt soul. James, he then stated there in the 17th verse, he said, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. That means that it is compassionate, said that it is full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now tell me which of those mindsets is the right one? What is right? You see, if you're God's peacemaker, then it is important for you to be able to discern the difference between the two. 
Are we called on to be covetous in this world today? Are we called on to be greedy as peacemakers in this world today? What do y'all think? Heard, huh? It was low, but I heard it. Did, call, did God, did he call on us to put the world first over himself? Did he call on us to disregard him and his way of good, his way of justice? Did he call on us to be wise and self-righteous and prudent in our own eyes? No, 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 no. No to all of that. As the proverb said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it's in is the way of death. And there from the 23rd and through the 25th verse there in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, the Lord, he lays down a very grave warning to those who take away justice from a righteous man. There is a promise that as fire devours stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, the root of the wicked will be as rottenness. The scripture then says there that God's anger is aroused against such wickedness and his hand, it is stretched out against them. Again, I don't know about you today, but I don't want God's hand stretched out against me. I want God to be for me. So it is important for us as his peacemakers to know right from wrong. Yes, because God, he is going to judge. Yes, because God, he is going to punish us but so that we can also move in the way that is right so that we can all move in the way that is good. This is why it is important for us to know what's right from wrong. We peacemakers, we peacemakers, we should live for what's right because we live for the Lord. We should live for what's good because again, we live for, for the Lord, don't we? We say that we love God. If we really do love the Lord, then we will commit ourselves to what he has defined for us, what's right. We will commit ourselves for living to what God has said is just. And again, we will do justly. We will learn to do right by each other by giving of ourselves. That is our duty as a child of God. And again, we must work today to fulfill that duty. Are you working today to fulfill your duty as a child of God? And if this is your mindset, Jesus, he said that if you love what you're doing as a child of God, if you love to fulfill your duty, you won't be looking for no reward. You will do your duty just to do your duty because you love it. Jesus said that when one compels you to go a mile with them, you go the second mile with them. Because again, that is what's right. That is how we help. That is how we lift each other up. Do we know what's right from wrong today? I hope that we do. And if we know what's right from what's wrong today, I hope that we will now commit our way, that we'll commit ourselves to doing what is right. Amen. 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 Hey there, thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.